Welcome to Innovations in a Community-Based Approach to Serious Illness Care Delivery Conference Call. My name is Adrienne, and I'll be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we'll conduct a question and session. I'm now turn the call over to Janelle Shear. Janelle Shear, you may begin. Hi, everybody. This is Janelle from Stratus Health, of the Minnesota organization that is part of the Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network, or LSQIN. The LSQIN represents Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin under the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Quality Improvement Organization Program. I'd like to welcome you here today to the Rural Palliative Care Networking Group, and this group is one that meets three times a year to network and learn from each other about providing palliative care services, especially to those in the rural area. People from all disciplines and settings are welcome to participate. So our educational session today is called Innovations in a Community-Based Approach to Serious Illness Care Delivery. We're pleased to have Sandy shown you here today from Alina Health, Alina Health Life Course, and she's going to present about their innovative model on providing care to uh, supportive care to people in late life. So before I introduce Sandy, we'll just say the phone lines are on mute. Uh, if you want to jot down your questions after the presentation, we'll have a time for Q&A, uh, so do that. But we'll also use the chat feature if you'd like to uh, just chat some questions in, and then we will answer those at the end as well. So Sandy has had many years of experience as a nursing leader and has focused on advanced care planning, hospice, and palliative care. She's an adult nurse practitioner and has served many patients and family at end of life in this role. As a senior research scientist for Alina's Health Division of Health Applied Research, she's the clinical co-investigator for Life Course, a life, late life research project. So thanks for coming today, Sandy, and presenting about your project. Thank you, Janelle. It feels like old home since I was one of the um, first um, participants in your cohort for rural palliative care. So it's really great to be able to share some of the things that we've been learning at Minnesota, or um, at uh, Alina Health uh, with the Life Course Project. And so um, over the next 40 minutes, I'd like to share with you some of the innovations that we've thought about that could bring um, late life care to all people living with serious illness. And um, we'll have, like as Janelle had said, we'll have time for questions and answers. And at this time, I have no conflicts of interest or relevant financial relationships. And over the next 45 minutes or so, using the National Consensus Project Clinical Practice Guidelines for Palliative Care and the preferred practices, we've adapted those to uh, be able to provide palliative care support to individuals two to three years prior to death. So individuals that really are not hospice ready or that could benefit from hospice. And so um, thinking about that, I'd like you all then to think about this question that I have for you is knowing that all of you are in some fashion providing palliative care in your community and have to figure out, to some extent, innovative ways to do that, either from resources or what you're delivering uh, to patients and families, is what if those of us, all of us, that would be in the later stages of life had someone to guide us through the maze of the social support as well as through the maze of health care choices and understand how those choices could support um, the most fundamental question, and that's what matters most, what's most important to us during this time, and really focusing on that rather than our medical condition. And if we think about what is the background behind what we're facing today, and most of you already know this, but seven out of ten of us will die from a serious illness, and will die from that serious illness over the matter of years, um, not months or weeks. And for the most part today, <clears throat> we're experiencing quite a bit of fragmentation that this type of care can occur across multiple venues. Individuals have multiple providers, and there are multiple concurrent medical conditions that most of us may have that conflict with disease management strategies. So if you're treating one illness, uh, treating that illness might be in conflict with treating another illness, and so it's often difficult to navigate that. And lastly, fragmentation occurs between patients and families when we really fail to honor how families and caregivers play a central role to the central disease management for individuals. And then lastly, most of our health, uh, 
health systems are evolving rapidly, and it's difficult for us to get a good handle on how we support individuals between acute hospital care and excellent end-of-life hospital care and inpatient palliative care that we have, which a lot of you are trying to, to cross that bridge right now, but we need to continue to figure out how do we innovate around that. So we began life course with a pilot in 2012. We enrolled 23 patients to really help us develop the model and cultivate public awareness and then rapidly moved into a longitudinal cohort study from 2013 um, through the end of this year where we currently have enrolled 1,800 patients. We've enrolled um, 1,800 individuals and we've enrolled 450 intervention patients and 420 comparison patients, as well as their key friends and family members in each group. We plan to um, survey and collect data on these individuals to the end of this year, along with this year starting to now implement this program across Alina as we move towards figuring out how do we provide this care in, in an environment where we're moving towards a value-based payment structure. We also have public engagement strategies that we've been focusing on through um, partnering with Twin Cities Public Television and Amper's radio stations. Our funding has evolved now throughout the project where for the, since the beginning we've actually been funded by a private organization, uh, philanthropy organization uh, called Robina. And then this year as we're starting to implement within the health system, the Alina um, leadership has invested now in the resources that it will take to implement our model within the health system itself. So I'd like to take just a few minutes to give you um, some background information around the model, and then we'll move into how we operationalized it, and then we'll open up to questions at the end. And as you're hearing this information, I'd like you to think about um, this is one approach for, that we tried to really increase the access to palliative care type interventions to patients and families. And there may be pieces of this, this that might work in your environment, um, or quite a few of them. So I'd be interested at the end to see um, how does this fit for you and what questions and concerns might you have about delivering this, this model itself. So I've got a five minute video that will show you through just in general through the eyes of the patients and families who serve as well as the care guides that actually provide the intervention what life course is about. <laughs> All right, we're going to try try one more time here.
persons with serious illness in the family can fall through the cracks. Leckert is an innovative approach to support patients and families who are in their last few years of life, the folks who may have advanced heart failure, that have advanced cancer, advanced dementia, COPD, Huntington's, uh, any of a number of conditions. Healthcare does a really nice job of taking care of folks in the hospital, and then we do really good when folks get very near the end of life. What we don't do is well in between what can be months, what can be years of time that a patient and family will face, struggle with, be overwhelmed by advanced serious illness, and so up to the level of end of folks during that long period. This is something that we can no longer do. How are things going to be? Well, pretty well. Pretty well. Pretty well. We use in the life course model many health care services to as likely life experience supporting someone with really advanced serious illness, but isn't a trained clinician. We call them care guides, uh, and their job really is to partner with them in navigating the system, in navigating the other systems that they may need to intersect with, so not just healthcare, but social service systems and some of the other social assets. They joined almost two years ago, and then we started meeting, and as I look back, it was monthly. We talked about both medical and non-medical concerns, and I guess it she kept in close touch with us and referred us to people that we needed to be referred to. She's been a real resource person for us. She listened to me. <laughs> I'm talking to you. <laughs> when patients talk about what matters most to them, what ends up showing up less than the majority of the time are their physical health needs. So beginning to understand that 70% of the time, it's about all of the other aspects of self. And so this has given us a way to ask about that, be able to capture it in the record, and then to be able to, with patients and families, develop that plan. So what you help me do is write a story that's now in your medical chart yeah. and includes those details that haven't been there in the past. What we really are trying to do with care guides partnering with an individual and their friends and family members is to engage in an empowerment model, to be clear about what chapters most, and then to really enable them to engage their primary care team members, their specialty care team members, but more importantly, all of those supports that exist outside of the health care system that they're going to need in those you know, last several years. I came to grips with my mortality a year ago, February. There's a continuity in relationship that seems to be really important to our patients. I'm still there even when they the transition into another level of care. By coming to grips with the uh, um, I found the teacher, and that's, that's available to anyone. I think it's taught me a lot about how to approach a serious illness um, with, with hope. The last project Bob completed is a book chronicling the last several years of his life and his thoughts on death, called How to Live Well and Finish Right. It includes the dedication to Judith Blomber, his life course care guide. Late Life is a production of Twin Cities Public Television in partnership with Alina Health, whose life course project, funded by the Rovina Foundation, granted the producers unique access to their ongoing research into late night care in Minnesota. <laughs> Well, I hope this video gives you a quick snapshot of um, patients and families that we serve as well as the role of the care guide. And I'd like to then now just move into a little bit about where we're at with outcomes and then move into the actual intervention itself and um, give a little bit more detail about that. And so our goal really is to understand if it's possible to maintain quality of life the last two to three years prior to death, given that we know that there's this, this progressive physical and cognitive decline with progressive illness, can we maintain it or slow the deterioration of someone's quality of life or their perception of it or actually improve? But we weren't actually thinking that we were going to improve very much, um, but our, our big goal was can we maintain it, knowing that it's, it's um, most serious illness is very progressive in nature. So our primary 
uh, evaluation of the wrong quality of life. We want to make sure that what we were providing also was a good experience. And then, in turn, if we were improving quality of life and people were getting the care that they felt was right to help them be guided and supported in the right way, that they would actually make choices differently. And so we would see then an integral or a step, stepwise effect on um, broader outcomes such as cost of care, uh, hospice utilization, inpatient days, and um, emergency department visits. And I'm happy to say that to, to date, we have longitudinal um, collection of data that is actually showing that our quality of life for the patients that experience this whole person, human-centered care actually maintains and is slightly improving and compared to our comparison patients and families that is actually slowly declining. So we are seeing a difference there. There's a positive experience for both patients and families, so we're happy about that. They're, they're not saying it's a negative experience. And we're seeing significant increases in utilization of palliative care. So for those of, uh, patients that are enrolled, they're twice as likely to get a palliative care consult and get connected to community resources. There was um, a significant amount of increase in advanced care planning um, discussions as well as documentation. Our comparison group were, remained at about 50, and they, they increased about 54%, whereas our intervention um, Patients and families started at 43% and our mocking percent, they almost doubled in advanced directive completion. Our hospice enrollment is around 54%, and that was actually quite a bit of an increase from a system perspective. Uh, for all, overall our deaths, only about 30% of people were admitted to hospice prior to death, um, and, and so that was quite um, an increase. Our comparison patients, it was about a 14% increase, but overall within our system. We've seen a reduction in emergency department visits and a reduction in inpatient hospital days, although we haven't seen as much of a significant impact on that because the number is so small and the, the confidence in, in, interval is so so large that we're, we're not quite sure what's making the difference there. So let's actually move into the intervention itself. And we see there are four key components to this model. And it's really to promote whole person care. And we do that using question sets and assessment tools that lead patients in discussions around their medical and psychosocial needs. So as we explore those aspects of whole person, we're always trying to understand what matters most to them. So based upon that part of their life, what's most important what is your focus at this time so that we can make sure that we help patients and families get the support that seeks to actually honor those goals and preferences. Alongside with that, we are really trying to create more of a family-oriented approach, enrolling patients and families at the beginning of care or engaging them in the beginning of care is, is vitally important rather than waiting until they're in crisis in the hospital where they have um, some sort of um, sentinel event, we're making sure that patients and families are part of conversations along the way to help support individuals in their decision making. And lastly, the model is delivered using the lay healthcare professional um, that the video so nicely described. We came upon these four key components really by looking at um, several different things. We talked with patients and families, community professionals, and clinicians and have listening sessions to really understand what matters most two to three years prior to death. The National Quality Framework for Preferred Practices and the National Consensus Project Guidelines um, outline practices for structured hospice programs and they're primarily designed for inpatient palliative care programs. And so we weren't quite sure if just lifting those and delivering them two to three years prior to death was really what patients and family needed. So we looked at those practices and asked the questions, if I were two to three years prior to that, what would that look like? And so we ended up um, thinking that we, we um, found that there were three of the eight domains from the National Consensus Project Guidelines that we thought needed more attention and expanded. And so uh, we included to expand the social domain to focus attention on family and caregivers. And I'll describe that a little bit more um, later. And then in the spiritual religious aspects of care, 
we wanted to make sure that we were helping patients and families explore the life lived, to honor the life lived while people were still living with legacy work, and really try to help understand um, anticipatory grief and loss. Since with chronic serious illness, there's this cumulative effect of loss over time. It's not just when someone gets that six-month prognosis, but they're living with multiple losses, so we wanted to understand what kind of support people needed during that time. And then the ethical legal aspects of care, we uh, wanted to pay special attention to the ethical domain, which is very important to make sure that we had very specific workflows around advanced care planning, and ensure that not only that advanced care planning was completed, but that we're integrating a process for ongoing goals of care discussion so that it's actually more of a cyclical process rather than um, readdressed when a sentinel event happens. And then there are a lot of financial and legal concerns two to three years prior to death, not just when someone is at the end of life, and so have intentional activities for the care guide to do around that. The next part of the key component or the, the bubbles uh, are what matters most. And again, that previous statement on the ethical domain is that we wanted patients to drive the plan of care and that treatments are not just disease-specific guidelines, which are often very limiting, and goals are often unmet or difficult to achieve from a disease standpoint. And so we wanted to understand how individual preferences, what matters most, and what's important to people influences um, other plans within the system. And so each visit is started out by asking what's most important to you, what matters to you. And you can see by the slide that we would get many other things beyond just I want to get better, I want to get stronger, or I want to be cured. Um, there were worries and concerns about um, shifts and roles in caregiving, finances, ability to work, um, spirituality, will changing my treatment plan affect um, how my faith uh, and faith is affected, um, will I be able to stay at home, how can I have a sense of meaning and purpose if I can't work anymore, all those types of things. And so understanding those are vitally important. Thirdly, there's a growing body of literature that reveals the strong link and in interplay among patients and families and their surrounding social systems that affect nearly every dimension of all aspects of life. And in the context of whole person, family is defined for us as a group of people related either biologically, emotionally, or legally. So we had a very fairly broad definition and wanted to understand who's at your table um, beyond just your medical team and community resources. It could be that someone is, um, someone takes the trash out, someone mows the lawn, someone does something else, but it's a very broad network that people are are um, using as a support system, so how do we actually understand that and, and ensure that people have that ongoing? We also realize that family are not healthcare providers, but they're the primary caretakers, and they have a range of roles that they've assumed with serious illness. There's a lot of physical demands, um, you know, simple things like repairing meals for a family member or actually doing medical interventions such as insulin administration or or running people to appointments, but there are often a lot of emotional and social support needs beyond just the patient, so we wanted to make sure we understood what the frustrations and the discouragements are really of, um, and the despair that could um, happen with living with chronic illness. We, in our study, we have found that family and caregivers are spouses, partners, adult children, siblings, friends, neighbors, you name it. We're really um, broadly interpreting that. And we often underplay or overlook the important role of caregivers, that they're not included in decisions until something is very serious. We still have a fairly autonomous one-to-one um, -one relationship with patients and um, don't include patients and families in that. Now, the last key component of the model is the care guide. The life course care guide is someone that we are seeking out that has um, typically a four-year degree. They've had several years of work experience, most typically not a medical background, but there's some sort of personal or professional experience that they've had with someone living with serious illness. And they, they're able to work independently as well as in a team-based approach. 
the age range of our care guides are from 20 into their mid-50s. Some, it's a second job or a transition to a new career. And the various backgrounds that we've had for care guides up until now have been an HR specialist. One has been a health unit coordinator in the hospital. Someone was a scheduler in a clinic. Social workers in um, getting social worker trained. Uh, psychology background, legal, spiritual background. One of our care guides was, if this was a step for him um, prior to going to med school. So he just saw it as a way for him to really embed um, his own personal approach into a human-centered, person-centered, um, uh, value-based approach. So the care guides received training over about a four-week four period, and it is based upon those 11 domains. They have a um, field guide for each domain that gives them background and information as well as key areas to focus on, and that includes um, uh, how to engage patients and families in that approach. They have a visit framework that gives them structure with each visit that uh, allows them to have a set of question sets as well as assessment tools that help them move along. They participate in communication skills training that focuses on the ORs and the SBAR, and these types of communication skills help them to define their role and their scope and professional boundaries as the care guide is not providing therapy, but more of a longitudinal therapeutic relationship that listens to patients and families so that they can understand um, what their needs are, inform them, link them, that help facilitate the care that they need. They also use electronic health records to connect with resources. They document the patient's goals. There is an ongoing collection of the patient's story as it, as it resides with the last interaction. And it's also used to help communicate across care settings um, throughout the health system. Care guides are also trained in depth in advanced care planning using the Respecting Choices Framework and how to assist patients in identifying their goals and what matters most. As um, care guides move forward in their practice, they are required to do skills validation and have preceptor support for that. Next slide. Their panel management for care guides ranges at, at beginning with a caseload of 45. As we begin to integrate within the health system, we see that that probably will increase to 60 or 70. Just we're not quite sure, um, but that's what care guides have been able to do at this point. And they meet with patients and families monthly, typically in their home, and they meet criteria through an eligibility report. Um, uh, they're, they're identified um, by, through an eligibility report. And at times, as their care over the, the two to three years, as things may be a little bit more stable, they may have phone visits versus in-person visits, but there is a monthly contact. And as uh, alluded to just a little bit earlier, we identify individuals that are seriously ill. So we're not really targeting people that are hospice eligible. We're really looking for people that are sick enough and living with a serious medical condition that they will need help and support prior to actually being hospice eligible. So we've developed an electronic um, eligibility report in their medical record that pulls information based upon their diagnosis. And so we're looking at people with advanced heart failure, kidney failure, liver failure, lung disease, cancer, dementia, Parkinson's, and coronary artery disease. From there, these individuals will fall onto a report and they'll be screened then by the provider um, based upon their patient panel and then we'll be reaching out to them to enroll. From a research perspective, we, we um, asked them if they wanted to enroll in a research study. So it's, it's transitioning to a different process or implementation within the system. So to operationalize this work, we had to think about four different things. One is, how do they do their work? What knowledge and background do they use to structure that? And how do they document their work? And so the primary purpose of a care guide is to have this longitudinal relationship. And before and after the visit, the care guides have a set of questions, interview, and assessment tools to help guide that conversation. They initiate conversations about quality of life, goals of care, and their end-of-life issues with their patients and family members, 
which then they use that information to link between patients, families, and healthcare systems. So really they are a guide by a person's side to help understand what their needs are. They're not to replace the expert work that um, people that are trained in palliative care or providers are are needing to provide. And so they're somewhat what we call a gap filler or the bricks between the mortar of the excellent care that we're already providing within the system. They facilitate communications about health preferences. They empower patients and families to talk about that during clinic visits, but then also share it through the medical record. And the idea then is that that information is linked to and provided to existing care, care um, clinicians so that they can actually individualize care plans based upon what matters most so that typical medical protocol is individualized based upon the context of personal preferences and goals. And then lastly, um, the patient's story is there to, to provide context around all aspects of whole person. So in other words, the care guide facilitates conversations, they communicate the patient's story, they document in the medical record, they collaborate with the patient's existing team members, and they link them to a set of resources that they have within their toolkit. They aren't providing medical advice or direct care. They're not providing education that is beyond the scope of what they should be providing, and they aren't really re recommending any health care or providers. So let's move on then to um, actually what does it look like when they meet patients and families. So what you see in front of you here is the six-visit, what we call the six-visit protocol that is designed to be more of an ongoing process of exploration. But the initial structure is structured over six visits to give the care guys an idea of how might I work through all aspects of whole person. And so you can see from um, visit one through six on the top line, there are a set of questions that tend to all aspects of whole person. And then within each visit, there are assessment tools. There are tools and assessments that the health system uses that the care guys are also doing, either as a patient self-report or an observational tool for the care guides to actually inform clinical providers. So the East Edmonton Symptom Assessment Scale, the Palliative Performance Scale. The health system has integrated the mini-COG into the Medicare Wellness Visit, so it's an integral part of the work that the care guides do when it hasn't been completed or they're noticing changes in cognition. The FICA is the spiritual assessment tool that is actually embedded within the question sets. And then there's a disease-specific advanced care planning interview that is done um, at some point during that time. And as, as you can see, as something, um, as events would change for patients and families, the idea is that there are aspects of whole person that might need readdressing, so they would readdress or review what they learned before to see if something's new or has changed. Go on to the next slide. This is just an example of the visit. Uh, one that would occur, and you can see that this visit is focused on what do people know about their illness, what do they understand about their illness, where might there be gaps of information so they can be connected, what kind of symptoms are they having, and are they bothersome, what they would they like to do about that, and how have things changed for them over the last few months or six months, just depending upon um, what's, what's been happening with them. The idea would be that there's a sense of what's the actual overall burden of the medical condition, how is it changing, and what kind of resources might they need for that, either to get connected to their provider for pain and symptom management or to doing the palliative performance scale, recognize that people are becoming more dependent or that they're losing interest in, in hobbies, that their nutritional intake might be changed so that they can actually get connected more proactively. Care guides are also interested to understand the overall mental health and well-being. So there's a general question that they ask in the beginning. And also really wanting to know, who is your support system? As I had said earlier, who sits at your table? And how well is that working for you? Do things need to change? Do you need additional support? Additional support? And then most importantly, how do you like to receive information? Who, who would be a central contact person? Um, if you were seriously ill, how would you like to receive that information um, and, and who from and who should be there? 
the first assessment tool during the first visit is that assessment symptom assessment scale. So you can just kind of um, get, get an idea of actually what they're doing. And so care guides are trained in all these aspects of whole person. And although this is fairly protocol driven by the six visit protocol, they're trained to understand that, you know, if it obviously looks like the patient is declining, they're not going to wait till the six visit to do the end of life questions. Um, and but they, they understand the context and the reason behind those questions and would adapt the visit protocol. The next few slides give, give you an example of the resources that the care guides have to help ground them in aspects of whole person. And what you see here is the physical domain field guide. It has typically each field guide has two to three topic areas. Some have assessment tools, and then. Um, a portion of the field guide gives them direction on what they need to do with that information. So as you can see from that visit one example, there are questions around what do people understand about their illness, their symptoms, and how well are they doing in their setting where they're living, and their functional status and their safety. Care guides would actually use the ESAS and the PPS, and then based upon those scores, they would explore with the patient when scores are greater than um, five or unacceptable to them and what they'd like to do about that, or if there's been a 10% change in the palliative performance um, score, it would be a trigger for them to explore what their needs are and get them connected appropriately. The next slide gives you an idea around the social domain. It's important to recognize who makes up a person's social network and to recognize when there are some complex issues and when people should get connected to professional resources um, sooner than later. We know that there is a lot of safety issues. People become isolated, socially isolated. There's housing issues and resource needs as well as caregiver burnout. So we want to recognize those um, proactively so people do not present in crisis. The tool that they have in this domain is a who's at your table exercise. And so they sit down with patients and families, and they have a piece of paper with a table on it with chairs, and they ask them who's at your table and list who they are and what types of things that they help them with. And if there are things that are missing, inquire of do you have someone to help support in this area or, or another. They would also inquire of um, how stable are these resources. Are they just occasional, or do they commit to helping you or not? So it's really trying to get a handle at What's the next step? Do they need more help? And the next slide will show you what we focus on for the ethical domain. As I had emphasized earlier, we're really trying to recognize and validate in an ongoing process individual goals and preferences, and then also recognize when decision-making capacity might be impaired um, um, and make sure that people are getting connected. So there is a three-step process that they generally reconcile, they validate, rec and reconcile, and clarify existing information in the medical record around advanced care planning, and then also have a disease-specific advanced care planning um, session with the patient and their healthcare agent. And then information is centrally documented in the medical record. And then in order to understand when there are shifts in decisional capacity, they're using the mini-cog to recognize those things and get connected to the provider. And that is not to diagnose dementia, but to really screen for when people might need that extra help. Um, dementia is one of those things where it often doesn't fall on the problem list, and um, it's just kind of one of those things that's unsaid or not really recognized until more of the later stages. So we're wanting patients and families to recognize those issues, understand when they can get resources to help, understand the frustrations to memory loss, and how that might impact um, individuals. We, we know that when people have serious illness, it's not just Alzheimer's. We know Alzheimer's is the majority of people that have dementia, but with serious illness, you might have acute or intermittent changes in memory and shifts in cognition, and we want to be able to recognize those um, as illness progresses so that families can adjust and support patients accordingly. And then lastly, communication and documentation. These care guides are trained so that they can actually document in the medical record. They have um, a protocol and a workflow to create their own progress notes. 
They have smart phrases that are attached to each one of those question sets so that we're getting some reliable documentation. And then um, the assessment tools are actually entered into an assessment flow sheet that um, other people in the system are also um, entering so that over time we're, we're getting a better sense of changes in functional status and pain and symptom management so that um, we can get the help um, more proactively. And then centralized advanced care planning. We're wanting really to make sure we've got decision makers in the medical record as well as if people are willing their advanced directive documents, but also those more detailed um, advanced care planning discussions that are there about their preferences, about end-of-life wishes, as well as their perspective on whether um, they would want to continue treatment if they were functionally or cognitively impaired. Um, and then lastly, as we are moving towards system integration, we're doing several things. We are integrating care guides in in 12 of our primary and specialty clinics across the health system. Um, this research project has been privately funded, and as we move towards system integration, we've worked with our senior leadership to really understand its impact, and it's a vehicle and a segue really to help us move towards value-based care. And um, so the, the health system is actually um, uh, supporting the system integration of care guides into existing care teams. And the goal would be that we've identified um, patient panels across our, our health system in our clinic so that care guides are a resource for all people that have serious illness. In addition, we know that our health system is fairly homogenous and that there is a low level of people that actually access end-of-life resources. And so we're not quite sure how well this model will fit for people that have different beliefs, values, and backgrounds. And so we are partnering with um, North Minneapolis area with the clinic as well as surrounding organizations that provide support to people with serious illness and end of life and working on them embedding a care guide from their community to actually do this work and understand how does this type of approach need to change culturally to really fit and work with what matters most for individuals in that community. Along with us in parallel, we're working with um, a couple of the payers to do a similar um, pilot study and be able to understand what it would take to bundle this two to three year process of care um, for people, for patients and families to get reimbursement for that. So I'd like to open it up to questions. Thank yeah. you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you have a question, please press star then one on your touchtone phone. If you wish to be removed from the queue, please press the pound sign or the hash key. If you're using a speakerphone, you may need to pick up the handset first before pressing the numbers. Once again, for audio questions, please press star then one on your touchtone phone. I'll ask a question. Um, this is Talk. So I'm interested in the phrase quality of life because it is and not everybody understands what that means. And when we talk about quality of life, I think it's Senator Frank and he says, if I've got chocolate ice cream and I can watch football, I'm good to go. But for everybody, it's different. How do you get at that, right? You're asking patients questions to really look at what quality of life means to them because we know that a lot of the pain is existential. A lot of the issues are about spirituality, not necessarily religious beliefs, but spirituality and regrets. Sure, sure. Good question. Thank you, Susan. For the research project, we used the Facet Pal survey tool around quality of life, and then for patients and families, we used the Promise 29. And both of those tools um, are whole person domain. Um, uh, each area has ten, um, five to ten um, points in it that actually go to each aspect of whole person to know that quality of life might be beyond just the physical illness. 
So that's what we use for the actual research. And as we move towards system integration, for several years now, our system has been studying and integrating the use of the PROMISE 10. And so the PROMISE 10 is currently integrated within our health system for all patients and families. Um, and so we are going to be migrating to PROMISE 10, which has two different focuses, one on um, mental health as well as physical health, and it's domain specific. So there's 10 key points that they're going to be asked around quality of life. I hope that helps. Oh, it does. It's, it's a good job. That was the first one. Facet Pal, F-A-C-I-T dash P-A-L, and it's on the outcome slide. If you go back to the PowerPoint, there's reference down there if you want to look that up. But we like that. It's, yeah. I have a slide. I was supposed to be in right there. Okay. Thanks. So that's, that's a great question. Great question. I have a bunch of questions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just very quiet. <laughs> um, but I can start asking some. Jennifer Morgava. Um, I think you, you stated this. So, this is a, no volunteers. These aren't volunteers. I care right. They are. They are hired, hired, and they are employees of the health system. We have been um, utilizing Care Guide for several years. This research was actually built upon research we did in primary care, where we embedded a Care Guide to partner with a primary care provider to manage diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and stroke. So care guides were in the clinic, and they met with patients as they were meeting with uh, their primary care provider, and they had a set of very clear protocols to help patients and families move through, like smoking cessation and those types of things. So we wanted to, because we really want to um, expand palliative care type support, this whole person support to all people who want to understand how can we do that in a way when our own workforce is either dwindling or it's really hard to get specialty trained people to do palliative care. And so we we wanted to understand what would it be like to train these care guides specifically around palliative care and hospice. So that's the reason. And so we've built um, uh, a job family that we have actually done some fairly deep work with our human resources department. So there's a job description and um, then a market analysis and a pay grade somewhat modeling after community health workers, but they're not community health workers. That makes sense, too. And it sounds like, I think, I don't know if this is initially from a grant or somehow you had some funding and they're now trying to integrate it into your system. Correct. Yeah, have you been able to sort of, you know, from a systems perspective financially sort of justify it with um, the different improvements that you noted and ED visits and whatnot? Yes. So with our initial results, and going to our executive leadership and the, the advisory board of the health system, um, we've gotten uh, engagement with our senior leadership and our CEO, Penny Wheeler, that this is really the focus of what we need to do, and they're investing that money into the care guide role. As we move forward to work with um, a longer longitudinal payment system for that with payers, so we're testing this with payers this year, also to figure out what would that reimbursement B, that we would negotiate with payers to provide this. So it hasn't necessarily been studied. We haven't done a full return on investment study on it. Um, the Alina decided to support the rollout of the program based on the outcomes around quality of life experience and service utilization. We just haven't had um, a big enough population that we've been able to get the full financial data for. So that's something mm -hmm. that we're planning on doing with the program implementation. My mm -hmm. hunch is it'll be similar more right. palliative in that, yes. you know, we mm -hmm. save money yep. and improve. If that's right, yeah. Sorry, can I keep asking? <laughs> yeah, let's just check in. Adrian, are there any questions in the queue? We have no audio questions at this time, but as a reminder, please press star then one to be placed into the queue. Okay, then the in person people will keep going. <laughs> um, one of my questions I had was just kind of um, more centered around sort of the lay guide. Um, mm -hmm. Sounds like they go through really, you know, extensive training. Um, I'm just kind of curious more specifically, probably as a provider, um, you know, how, and it looks like you actually would show kind of how they, if this and this, you know, these scores, and they would 
you referred. Um, yeah, because I guess I'm just kind of wondering how does that play out? You know, how does the how does the lay die know that the family or patient doesn't understand their illness necessarily? Because that's something that's tricky to tease out if you don't maybe have a medical background. That's hard to realize. Oh wait, they they don't understand that their heart failure is is continuous. You know, or is a sure. chronic illness. Um, sure. And um, and then too the the issue with dec- you know declining. Providers are really bad at knowing if a patient is declining, so I wouldn't expect, mm-hmm. you know, a lay person, even if they're excellently trained, to really know, well, gosh, their time is getting really short. We need to sort of get other pieces in place. So yeah. how can you can comment yeah. on that? Yes, that's a good question. We get that out. Ask frequently. <laughs> um, and, and being a provider myself and, and doing palliative care, you just kind of naturally kind of see this progression and have this natural discussion, but how do you train someone who's not embedded in this to recognize just generally what a serious illness might be? And so we put them through training within our physical domain in that first topic area, understanding this illness. We give them background and information generally around a a medical condition, Um, and then we help them understand what are some of the complications they might receive. What might they see if the illness is progressing? And not always in medical terms, but what might they physically be seeing? And then what might be the psychosocial changes that they're seeing? And then along with that, help them understand at these times, they might need to make decisions. And they might need to make medical and non-medical decisions. And those are the triggers then to recognize that either people don't understand this general concept around their illness and they need to con- connect with their provider, um, or they have decisions to make. So they have one-page um, information generally around each medical condition, links to the health system where they have videos where they can understand the general background. We're not asking them to medically manage and to recognize um, those things to medically manage, but based upon... When you've got increased pain and symptoms, something's happening, something's worsening, or if their performance is changing, you can see that that's relatively related to advancement of disease. So the interplay between giving them general information on understanding the illness and these two assessment tools is enough for people to realize things are changing. We do quite a bit of work in kind of that trajectory work. So there's a Murray, the Murray article is just awesome on getting the different types of trajectories people typically go through, the the cancer trajectory, the chronic illness trajectory, and then the frailty dementia trajectory, and help them understand that there's lots of role play and um, exercises that they go through. And they're working together with their healthcare team, so they're not in isolation. And so um, the care... Are they calling the, the primary clinic or... or so they're in the home, um, but they're connected to the clinics that we're, they're working with, and we're just launching into that, and and so we're going to learn more of what that actually looks like. But if care guides are more clinic-based and have that relationship, they'll either be connections through the medical record, so they in basket, or they're at the clinic once or twice a week, but they're having more real-time conversations with providers. Or they're actually attending clinic visits with patients and families and helping to share what they're seeing out in the home. So they're not really there to tell tale, but they're just they're um, trained to be objective observers to help facilitate the information between what everybody knows. And they pay special attention to dissonance, especially around goals, so patients' goals may be very different than family goals, which are very different from physician goals. And we don't want them to fix that, but they need to recognize it so that they get conversations going. So I hope that. Well, how do providers think about this? I mean, maybe they're still coming up. So one big shift this year um, between the research and the, you know, we're finishing up the research but also rolling out the program is that um, care guides are not working with research participants are being managed by somebody at the clinic that they're attached to, and they only see patients within that clinic. So we're really working on getting them embedded into a specific care team. We have an evaluation framework set up to begin interviewing those providers as the year goes on, so we'll have more answers after that. But because it's such a shift in the research model, where they really were working out of the hub and the division of applied research, mm-hmm. and um, weren't connected to one clinic, they saw patients 
over all the Linux Linux. We're just figuring out what the um, what the providers are going to think working closely with them. They've been excited to have the care guides in Linux. That's been a nice start. But <laughs> that's a good idea. I know, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I I do know that with the existing work that we've done, providers have um, given feedback to care guides or through in-basketing saying, this is just the right amount of information, this patient's story, for me to have this conversation that they typically weren't able to have. Or the trigger or the heads up that I learned this today in this visit, and they're seeing you next week. I wanted to let you know about that. It's a different way, and it, it really helps. Um, so this should start at a different place during the clinic visit versus at ground zero. When patients come with their best behavior and they're, you know, they're trying to put across their best during a clinic visit, it helps get things real easier for them. Um, how did you make a decision to start about two to three years out from death? I just think that chronic illnesses can start much further upstream, mm -hmm. and, you know, of course, we should be delivering whole person care everywhere, but how did you make that decision? A couple of things really influenced that. that one was personal. Dr. Eric and Anderson and I are the investigators on this research project and have two or three, de three decades worth of working together and the frustration from a, a personal perspective and being caregiver for many family members, not being able to navigate the system and not getting access to care. And, and it started when our loved ones had this more serious illness part Prior to that, they're fairly autonomous and manage things pretty well, but it's when things became to be more serious that family was not included in that process. And it was very frustrating for me, personally, um, being the advanced care planning guru and palliative care person and people saying, no, he's not ready for palliative care yet or hospice. And, you know, so that frustration level, personal experience, and then we know that within our system, we provide excellent hospice care. We have a very robust palliative care inpatient service as well as community, home care, and a, a robust care management. And so we, I think, have the conundrum of there's lots of people in the pot, and how do we support a person the best that we can given all the other resources? And so the serious illness time span with the piece where we felt like we could support existing services that are provided and make sure that there's no gap in services. Um, because all the other services within our system are still episodic and um, care stops. Even though that care is great, you know, the transition coaches that we have and the care management, is stopped after a certain period of time and with serious illness, time just keeps marching on. Um, versus someone who's more chronic disease, and they're kind of doing well pretty much for themselves, they probably don't need that. So going up too far upstream is probably not good for the resources. Well, related. <laughs> um, how you mentioned that you had a screening tool and you listed, you know, all the diseases that mm -hmm. are super appropriate. What is that screening tool? How did you, I know I, I trained at Mayo, like they actually, for their home based palliative care, they had a, a tool that they used to help them they qualify for, mm -hmm. for home based palliative care, for example. But how did you, what was your tool? How did you pick those? Sure. Um, we wanted something that could be broadly translated, so we wanted to look what was available in the medical record. And diagnosis, the fact that they'd had um, hospitalization or clinic visits, they have a primary care provider within the health system, and we are looking at comorbidity scores. So we, we're using a combined um, comorbidity score, and anybody that falls on um, with a comorbidity of four or more falls on the list. If they have four or more comorbidities in addition to one of those? It's the comorbidity score. So based upon, and I can give you more information around that, um, we've tested it for, for reliability and validity around the accuracy around that. So it's really lifting up people that could have serious illness. And it still takes some, what if um, a clinician look at it, so that's why we're putting the list in front of providers to say, no, don't even go there with this person um, that definitely 
uh, 15 out of these 20 patients. And again, we're going to be testing that more as we go through integration and what that looks like um, within the system. As we were doing it with research, we had a research nurse that looked at the list and screened um, based upon things in the medical record. So we're, we're now needing to transition to what can we broadly translate that is that out. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so we took her logic, the research nurse's logic, and we worked with a line of performance resources to build a quick few dashboards. So mm -hmm. all of the criteria that she would use, mm -hmm. that way, I was being conservative about it. She didn't want to rule out too many patients, you know, mm -hmm. to try to get the magic of the, like, group thought process. But we gave, she worked with uh, performance resources to create the logic behind it, and they pulled it um, from that quick few dashboards. So you can filter by clinic and provider and then bring to the provider and say, you've got 10 patients who might be able to, well, what do you think? Do you, you know, from what you know about them, are the accurate? Are they about to go into hospice, in which case they're not right? You know, will they absolutely hate this program? <laughs> that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We really didn't want people that were hospice ready and eligible. It just didn't make sense. They need to get into hospice. Okay. So they're eligible before. Ready for hospice. We, we would see them, but it doesn't really help. I mean, I think the short-term relationship is just not always helpful. Mm -hmm. sure. So we would encourage the provider to say, maybe you should introduce that versus and help them with that versus us seeing them in another set of hands in the pot. So how does it work, Sandy, when someone's eligible, the physician approaches the patient's family, and they say, yeah, we want to do it, then... Is it turned over to a care guide then? Is so the care guide the only person in the program that they see you know, other than their primary care? Yeah, I'll let Yeah, yeah. So in, um, it's a bit different from, from the research because in the research we had the defense defenders um, who work with research assistants and stuff. In the program, uh, we let the clinics decide the exact protocol they want to use, what they think fits best for them. What we've seen so far is what they prefer to do is have the care guide go to the provider to send a list of, you know, potentially eligible patients. The provider or somebody who works with the provider will alert the patient. We have this program to be getting a call from the care guide, and then the care guide will call them. And that care guide is their point of contact. Okay. Good. Thank you. So one of the things I this is Susan. This one of the things I did not hear you mention is post. I only heard you mention mention advanced care planning and I sit on the state post group. Mm -hmm. And I cringe about the post sometimes. Um, not that I oppose it, but I'm a lay person, so I have a different perspective. But I worry about the communication regarding the post and a doctor not trained walking in and saying, do you want to be resuscitated or innovated mm -hmm. without talking about the construct, just like you're sure. talking about. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, does that ever come into play? Is that a conversation people have? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the pulse is still a very integral part of advanced care planning. So it, it, there's really three processes that they do. It's kind of a technical process where they reconcile what's in the medical record, they um, understand where there are differences, and they have advanced care planning discussions in a structured way. And then at the end of those, they fill out the forms that feel like and seem like they're the most beneficial, one of which could be the healthcare directive. There's a statement of treatment preferences that they fill out based upon um, physical and cognitive disability. And then if people's illnesses and preferences are very specific, they will do a poll have that conversation, and then either go with them to the clinic um, or encouraging the family to go to the clinic and have a conversation. So it, it, is, it is part of it. Um, yeah. It would be an unsigned. Right, yeah. right. But they would put on the back that they help facilitate the conversation. It's always up to the provider to review what's on there. Thank you. Very much part of it. I have one more question, and then I won't answer. Yeah. So on an international level, because this seems like a model that certainly has national implications, have you met or worked at all with Dr. Ira Bayak? Because this is the work he's doing. He talks about whole person care. He's moved into, I can't remember the name of the center that he has created. Mm -hmm. And 
I just can't imagine he wouldn't be very, very interested in the work you're doing. Mm-hmm. No, we haven't had specific conversations with him. We've been um, in conversation with other national leaders. Eric Coleman, who did the transition um, care model, he's, he's actually on our advisory board. Dr. Joanne Lynn is on our advisory council, um, national, and Dr. Diane Meyer. So we're connected with CAPSI and um, with the end-of-life areas. We've been involved with CTAC, Coalition to Transform Advanced Care in Washington, and um, connected with other organizations like Cambia and those types of things, having conversations with them. The idea would be that after we move towards um, integration across our health system and then partner with health systems within our state, we would like to partner with individuals across the nation to see how we could translate this. So it's the goal. Thank you. Adrian, any questions in the queue now? We have no audio questions at this time. Okay, so now we will open it up for a networking discussion. And the question is, have folks uh, either in the room here or out um, on webinar land use lay workers in your palliative care program? So either lay paid workers or lay volunteer workers. Just kind of curious of the use of lay workers. I believe you probably need to push um, star six, and then you'll be able to uh, have your, or state your comment. Actually, um, do you need to press star one? Sorry. Should be placed in the queue. Oh, otherwise I could open up all the lines. Then star six would need and then need their lines. Okay, why don't you just open all of them? We'll okay, them. certainly. Thank you. One second. Thanks. I'll let you know you're open. And all lines are open. To unmute your line, please press star six. And to unmute, please press star six. All right. So is anyone using lay workers in your program? in any capacity. We, in our advanced care planning group, which is kind of connected but somewhat separate to our inpatient palliative care group, there are volunteers who do ACP, will come in and do ACP discussions in addition to our you know, trained social workers that are doing ACP discussions with inpatient. Oh. If we have those available too in all the clinics and clinics as well. Mm-hmm. So they've gone through some training. Yeah. <laughs> you can't hear over here anyway. Yeah. Can you, uh, can you all hear us okay? Just the operator, all lines are open. I, I hear you fine. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, there's a question in the chat It says, if an RN is interested in getting involved in this program, are there any roles now or possibly in the future where they might, where that might be an option? When we were doing the original research, we had an interdisciplinary team that helped us shape the model. So the idea would be that the lay healthcare workers um, added to existing healthcare teams so we wouldn't be hiring extra clinicians. That the idea is that we um, would want to enhance the work that they're doing rather than um, replacing them or adding clinicians. So care guides really are the model going forward. So when a person is enrolled in palliative care or hospice care, do they keep their care guide? They do. Um, Palliative care, inpatient, or community, um, depending upon if there's how longitudinal their care is, the care guide really understands and takes a cue from that care team. 
what the needs of the patients are. So they're there and they're ready and they're waiting for when their episode of care stops or and they negotiate between patients and that care team they're involved in. Any other uh, discussion about using lay workers or anything else folks want to network about uh, relating to palliative care? All right, so this will conclude our program today. Thanks so much, Sandy, for coming and speaking to us. Our next meeting, if you want to hold the date, is Tuesday, September 27th, uh, again from 10 to 1130, and the topic is developing a community-based palliative care program on the evaluations for quite a while for these meetings. I've been receiving comments saying, how do you start a, you know, a palliative care program that's in the community? So that's what uh, our program will be about. We'll have two rural programs talk about their journey and I'll send information out as it gets closer. So those that are participating in person, please complete your evaluation and there's a certificate for you to use for uh, continuing head credits. For those that are on the webinar, we'll send you an email with a link to the uh, evaluation on the program and then when you complete that, you will receive your certificate done. So this session is recorded and will be available in about two weeks. So thanks, everybody, for coming and logging on, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating, and we now disconnect.